ponder this question here, because what we're going to be talking about today is, and this is going to affect specifically three people in this room, because this is going to be something brand new. Natasha and Taylor and Carla. It's going to be something special for us. So let's discuss this question. What is, and I'm, I'll put these words in quotation marks deliberately, mystical, mysterious, and miraculous about Holy Communion? What makes it those three qualities? Any ideas? What makes it, let's, let's, start, let's start with the first one. Mystical. What makes it mystical? It's all something we cannot see. So we have to have the faith. Yes. Mystics, you know, uh, I put that as a negative concept. And you put it up there, okay, we'll go with it. Uh, but, you know, it's one of these things that your faith life is built around this. Yep. And only through the Holy Spirit that has given you this gift can you go forward from this point on. And that's the mystical side of it. Yeah, I understand. That's why I chose the word deliberately, by the way, because of the because of the negative spin. When you talk about when people talk about mystical today, it's all about magic or magical things or uh, fantasy storylines. That's all mystical. But I'm putting it in the spin where God wants it to be. It is mystical because there is, and that's the second word. There is a mystery about communion. What do you think is mysterious about communion? What would you think is mysterious? Well, I guess it's the fact that we're, um, it's, it's the blood of Jesus. Having it back then, and then we, we recreate it. We keep doing. I mean, we. It's very. It's just very holy. I mean. Okay. There's another word <coughs> to use it. Very holy. Um, but it is somewhat of a mystery in the context of how does this happen? I mean, there's, and this is where I believe Rome gets it goofy, and. Their whole concept of tr what they use, big fancy schmancy word called transubstantiation. And basically what they, how they define transubstantiation is the bread that is in Holy Communion transforms into flesh. And the wine the same into blood. It changes its elemental structure to become something else. It is their attempt, and, I, and, and this is also where it is a mystery, it is their attempt to solve the mystery of the words of Jesus. Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. It's their attempt to try to solve the mystery. Well, in spin of holy, as Carla shared with us, this is one mystery that we're not intended to solve. It is intended to be, to use the word, an oxymoron. It is both bread and flesh, both wine and blood, simultaneously. How can that happen? Well, the bread is still bread, the wine is still wine. But yet, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. So there's a tension between the two. And, or another way of saying it, a paradox. It's like, say what? doesn't make sense. It's not logical. And it's not supposed to be. And that's the paradox. It's not supposed to be logical. It's supposed to be, as Dennis shared very ac accurately, it's supposed to be received by faith. It is the words of Jesus that we believe. That's what it's all about. It's the words of Jesus that we believe, the words that he speaks. I still, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to stand up in the middle of sermon starts screaming it is 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 exactly it is is not represents doesn't symbolize is is not any of those words that say it's sort of kind of like is is is, is. you know and, and people 
I had a long discussion with uh, one gentleman one time about that. And he says, well, that, the body and the blood represents. And I'm going, no. Nope. nope. <laughs> I didn't say that anywhere in there. Jesus, now don't change his words. What did he say? Is. Well, is could represent. No, no. Is is is. And, and people don't comprehend, and that's part of our faith life, that, that we have to stand so firmly on that representation. Is means exactly that. Yes. It doesn't mean anything else, because as soon as you say it's something else, you just shot the whole thing down. It doesn't mean, hey, listen. I'm, I'm, I'm just letting you teach. Here we go. No, well, I don't, don't want to teach kids, but at the same time, <laughs> think about that. If you change that word, that means that you, you've left the door open for any interpretation you darn well please want it to be. No. Because we, we have this undying need to solve the paradox, to solve the riddle, to solve the mystery. We have to wrap everything up into a nice, neat little tiny package. Communion is not to be wrapped up in a nice, neat tidy package. We can't do it. It's something we accept by means of just plain faith. We accept the words of Jesus. You know, and we can all get all into the whole concept of God's Word, which we'll probably do that next week. But for us, it is the center and the foundation of our faith. So what is in God's Word is the truth. And when it is the truth, then we see these words. So, that takes care of mystical, mysterious. How about miraculous? Miraculous would be uh, he gave his uh, body and blood for us for the forgiveness of our sins. That's yep. in, important to, uh, to know because as as people, uh, you know, normally we want to hear from somebody a person we've done something against. We want to hear, okay. Please forgive me. Mm -hmm. And from God, you don't actually, you don't exactly hear. Okay, you are forgiven. Right. But you hear that from the pastor, and you and you receive that forgiveness by faith. Yep. From exactly. His grace. There and there's the miracle. Well, I think it's also a miracle the fact that it is the body and blood at the same time. Because a miracle is something that can't be explained by science, and that's where the problem is. I mean. 500 years ago, Christians would have had no problems with this interpretation of it, or you didn't have the splits, because people believed in miracles back then, but people, they try and explain everything with science now, and that's that's where it comes into the representation, they're trying to explain it away and say, well, I can't see this actually turned into something, so therefore, it's just a representation of yep. the Last Supper, yep. because they're trying to explain away the miracle. Right. Or the uh, the other the other side of that Which same cheapens point. baptism at the same time. They have that <laughs> Cheap, yeah, exactly. Because then you well, no, exactly. there is no spirit. It's just you're doing a symbolic action. And that's 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 what it is. Is the denominations are trying to use the scientific method on something that doesn't apply. The science doesn't apply. Right. And the last three parts of the catechism: baptism, confession, and the Lord's Supper defy that scientific explanation because they all deal with the miraculous the miraculous of how can water and God's word forgive for the scientific person for the non-believing person they say it can't it must symbolize or different denominations trying to solve the riddle it symbolizes the forgiveness of sins. But it can't do it. Well, scripture is very clear uh, <laughs> regarding baptism. Yes, it does. And it has to be addressed by faith. Confession. You know, how can just speaking words to a person or a God you can't see forgive you of your sins? There's a layer of mystery and there's a layer of miraculous. And then obviously what we're talking about today the gift of Holy Communion, the body and blood of Jesus, who was alive on this world. Here's where a lot of logic attempts to solve this. Jesus was there that night. And so, yes, that night, then it worked. 
every other celebration, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, is just a remembrance of that night. Oh you know, yeah, he meant it when he said it back then. It doesn't apply now. Uh, when has ever the word of God stopped applying and is exactly what it says? Anyway, so we're going to take a look at what it is. There is a couple of terms just to throw at you, just for grins and giggles to know. Uh, Holy Communion is also known as the Lord's Supper. It is also known as the Sacrament of the Altar. It is also known, I didn't put this on here, it is also known as the Eucharist. Uh, just different titles to describe the same thing. But they're, they're there for. It is, as we, as we have always looked at it, it is a gift from God. It is the body and blood of Jesus for us to eat and drink for the forgiveness of our sins. It is the most intimate expression of God's love for us. And if we look at that, you know, let's, let's focus on that last statement. It is the most intimate expression of God's love to us. For those of you who heard it this morning, those of you who will hear it later, it is God's love when he, from the outside of ourselves, tells us, this is my body, this is my blood. We eat and we drink and we take right into here, right into our guts, Jesus. And then that love, that Jesus, then comes right back out in the forms of our activity and our faith and everything else because we are forgiven. It is God's most intimate because it is the connection to... Let's back, let me back up. Let me, okay, this is not on your outlines. There's some, something that popped into my head. Pardon me, a little bit of a sidebar here. How many different ways do we know that God forgives our sins? How many different ways? That we know of for absolute certain. Well, I mean, theoretically, there is only one way because it's blood. Ultimately, right. it has to be spilled, and that's the other thing I'd say that makes it intimate. Because until Jesus came, how the Jews got forgiven was they slaughtered an animal and then they ate the animal parts of it. Right. And essentially, that's what we're doing at communion. It's the exactly. it's the blood, the blood of Jesus. I mean, that's. That's the only reason we have the forgiveness is because he shed his blood. Right. That's the foundational piece. Scripturally, three. there's three. Communion, baptism. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3. He's talking about the, the, salvif the salvificness of the water of the flood, which points us to the water and the word saving us in holy baptism. So there's two. The third way is the verbal communication. The proclamation of sins forgiven one to another through me to the congregation or to an individual. There are three ways or we as Lu in Lutheran circles use the terminology <coughs> means of grace. There are three ways that we use in order to receive uh, and distribute the, the grace of God through through all communion. But yeah, Richard, you are exactly right. It is the it's blood. all secured by blood. All secured by blood. Absolutely, the shedding of the blood. So it is a very intimate relationship that Jesus has with us. So that's why we, in, in very real ways, we um, we're going to get into. It. We're going to actually spend some time this morning studying. 1 Corinthians 11, the section on Holy Communion. We'll spend some time in that. But what Holy Communion, what it does, it gives us three things. It gives life, it gives grace, it gives forgiveness. It gives all, gives all three of those. Uh, it gives life. In the, in the death of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, thereby we are given life. It gives grace. It is a grace act of God. It, uh, a wonderful act of mercy to people who receive it. A wonderful act of mercy and grace. And then it gives forgiveness. Jesus, in his own words, tells us that specifically. So, Holy Communion, worthy of reception. We're going to look at this in, in the realm of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
Who receives this, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, receives this in a worthy manner? There's a lot of people who believe, who think that, you know what, if I, I, I have to be in the right frame of mind. Part of it, that's true. But many people think, well, I'll receive communion when I get my life straightened out. I'll you know, in other words, there's a lot of people, a lot of Christians who are out there who, who will, because their life is a mess, because things are going on in their lives, they stay away from church. Because it's in their mind, and I've heard people say this, that I need to get my I need to get my head straightened up before I come back to church. Well, this is the place that we come to get our heads wrapped around. And to get our heads re reoriented. That's what we Be need it the most. Yeah. And that's what we need it the most, exactly. So, a lot of people, I'm, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, and I'm speaking of one specific individual that I know. I'm angry at the church, I'm angry at people, I'm angry at stuff, so I'm staying away. And this same person is also realizing I need something in my life, but I don't, can't really put a handle on what it is. But he doesn't want to go to church because it's all full of hypocrites. And I understand the logic of it, but the reality is every person who walks in that door, including moi, is a hypocrite of one in some way, shape, or form. Or at least so the world thinks. I think, and what the world and what God is teaching me is. I'm a sinner in dire need of salvation. And the one place I can go to hear it and be filled and refreshed and renewed and to be strengthened is right amongst a bunch of people who are in the same boat I am. A whole bunch of sinners who need the same thing that I have. And if he thinks a bunch of hypocrites, that doesn't mean he has to be one. He can just come in and... Mm -hmm. And it's... He, and he needs to do his children. Yep. Somebody, somebody might know who I'm talking about. Yeah. But the interesting thing, thank you for messing my whole line of thought up there with me, Warren. Anyway, um, <coughs> we need this. Bottom line is we need this. Uh, and when we're feeling down in the dumps and feeling hurt and feeling struggling when people are being people, we who are sinners who also deal with the same things that every other sinner deals with, except for one key element. We got God. And we have his forgiveness. And we have Jesus who gave up his body and shed his blood. So that's what ultimately, I mean, I've, I've got all the all the technical words written up here. But bottom line is, what makes me worthy to receive Holy Communion? That I know that I'm a filthy, no good, rotten, good for nothing sinner that needs forgiveness. And I know that in Christ, in Jesus, I have forgiveness. And in His Supper, He's giving it to me. His body and blood given and shed for me. Boom! That's what makes me worthy. That's why I come. If I believe that, basically, you're good to go to come to the table. There's a little more to it than that. But that's the bottom line. That's the foundational piece to it. That's why we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11. So... First Corinthians 11. Let's take a look at that right now. So we're going to start at verse 17 in First Corinthians 11. Give you a little background while we're flipping there. <coughs> and that background is the church in Corinth, the church that Paul established, and then as was Paul's pattern, he started the church, got it established, got pastors trained, lo local guys to uh, take over the ministry. I've got you trained, I've got you taught, go for it. And Paul left, moved on to the next community. Well, Paul got wind of, of, of a few problems. Uh, see, the problem with Corinth was it was a very, it's the term, terminology, a cosmopolitan city. Which means there was a lot of beliefs, a lot of thoughts, very much like modern cities are today. There's a lot of stuff 
that goes on within the framework of the cities. And the church, who is a part of that city, a part of those people, still carrying some of the old ways with them, even though they believe in the salvation of Christ, they're still dealing with the old baggage. And a couple of old baggages that they were dealing with had to, first of all, had to do with communion. They thought, based upon the words of what Paul is telling us here, they thought that communion was a giant party. Now, I will say this. We have, through the liturgy, which came as a result of all, but the liturgy that we use, the formwork, the, stru the structure of our worship services, came as a result of development of this over about 2,000 years. Very, very slow development. It hasn't changed much in 2,000 years. But that's okay. That's okay. The structure is solid. It's, it's firm. But here in Corinth, it is really before the structure started to take place and to take real effect. So here, as they were celebrating, more than likely, although we've got no real evidence except trying to read the backstory in through Paul's words, we have the idea that there was a kind of a party going on. There's wine, there's bread, and you know, they really weren't into what was happening. They were just more into, let's do something. Let's have a celebration. That's what communion is, but it got twisted. Anyway, long story short, Paul finds out about this. So in the letter, he shoots, oh, he was nasty. He, he was downright, you know what, you guys are messing this up royal. So let's take a look, starting at verse 17. If I can have somebody read for us uh, 17 through 19, please. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there are to be differences among you to show you, to show which of you have God's approval. Okay, so Paul starts all this whole thing and says, I'm hearing these really nasty uh, stories coming out and 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 you're goof and you're messing up what, is, what the words that Paul says when you come together as a church he's talking about worship he's talking about the celebration of the sacrament when you come together as a church there are divisions among you okay this is not good the church does not need divisions. The church is unified and based, based upon the faith in Jesus Christ. But Paul says, you know what? I believe that. I believe that to the point where the divisions must come out. Why? Because one side or the other on the division is going to have they're going to be in line with what God says. And they have to come out to be seen for what they are. Paul says, okay, I get this. This needs to happen in the church. It has to happen. The divisions have to be addressed. It's very similar to what Jesus, uh, John said about Jesus in John chapter 1. I, you know, we've gone over this in, in several times. Jesus comes to shine the light of the gospel. And sometimes people who are still stuck in darkness, in their own selves, in their own sins, the light has to expose it. <clears throat> We cannot operate on two different wavelengths. We've got to be unified. So that's the whole reason Paul is writing this section in the letter to the church. We've got to get this out open so that we can bring what unifies us together. I got to bring it. To, I got to bring it together. So if I can have somebody read 20 through 22, please. When ye come together, therefore, into one place. This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Yep. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> Have ye not houses to eat and, and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. The King James is a little more in your face kind of expression. The NIV washes it out a little bit. 
But the bottom line is, Paul is saying, uh, people, why are you here? Why do you come? Is it to be just a party and get drunk? If you're going to do that, bye-bye, go home. We don't gather together for that reason. We don't gather together for that reason because we don't want anybody to see anybody else other than in the condition that they are. Sinners who need of grace. It doesn't matter whether you're rich, poor, black, white, male or female, slave or free. We are all one in Christ Jesus, Paul calls us. It makes no difference. And what they, what they were doing was amplifying the differences. Making people stand out where they shouldn't. That's, and that's one of the things why Paul was highly perturbed. You can, you can, read, you can read between the lines and some of the, and the verbiage of Paul. It seems like they were also excluding the poor people from it, much like at the temple, if you didn't have the funds to mm -hmm. give the right sacrifice, you didn't get forgiveness. Yep, exactly. But I love what God did in the realm of the sacrifices that hardly anybody knew. He made provision for the poor. You know, here, if you can't afford this, then do this. It, the effect will still be the same. But yeah, but the church didn't recognize that. The priest that. tried to make the it. The priest so, yeah. tried to make it something else. Yeah. And so this is what's happening. Is you're, you're, you're pointing out something that to many people is very obvious. And that's what the Catholic Church did in the 1500s. Oh, yeah. Oh, my word. Yeah. If Dude. you didn't donate enough, you weren't able to go to communion. Yep. And when you did, when, <laughs> and then the flip side of that was, and if you did give enough, we'll have a private mass just for you. Well, my dad's church, he was Catholic, they actually had to pay for the pew. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, I, I will say this. On a positive spin of the whole indulgence thing, and that was, it was a unique fundraiser to build the church building. Because that's what it was all about. It was about beating, building St. Peter's Basilica, and Rome was busted. They didn't have any money. So somebody came up with this cockamamie idea, hey, we can sell forgiveness. That would be great. You know, it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, side of the We can, If they'll just buy in forgiveness from us, we can rake in the cash. Creative. Stupid. But creative. For annulments, if you have the right amount of money, you can have your marriage annulled. Yep. Yeah, it's all about cash flow. That's like you're selling forgiveness. You can't do that. Because there's nothing, there's nothing to sell. It's a freebie. It's a free gift from God. There's nothing to be sold. Okay, get me off that soapbox screen. <laughs> but you we're getting the idea, even in modern context, the struggles that was going on in Corinth. Same story, different location, different time, but the same problems. We're still dealing with the same problems, even within our own church body. Today. We're still today, 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 right now. Yes, we're still dealing with that problem. But anyway, moving, moving forward. So Paul, he's already challenging them, and he's saying, uh, "Shall I commend you for this? Shall I praise you for this?" And to borrow a, a phrase from from the English, not bloody likely, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, here's, he's challenging, he's addressing the sin, he's addressed the sin, now he gives the teaching, he tells them, this is what it is. That's the key, key word, is. If I can have somebody read 23 through 26, please. I got it. God, go. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and went up to bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay, so 
this is what it is. The simple eating and drinking of bread, unleavened bread. We've got to go back to the Passover to get the structure of this because that's what Jesus did. He changed the Passover meal. That's what happened on Monday Thursday. Or mandate Thursday. What the word mandate, it's, it's Latin, which means mandate or command. John calls it, I give you a new command. And Jesus gives us a new command to celebrate Holy Communion. Uh, that command, by the way, is recorded in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Funny thing, on the way to the Gospels, I don't have to head to that, um, John does not record the institution of the Lord's Supper on that day. What does John record? Any ideas? John records something significant that happened that night. The betrayal? Well, they all had the betrayal. All four of them did. Something that John recorded to happen in that, in that event that, didn't, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not record. The foot washing. Oh. The cleansing. The, wash, the washing of the disciples. John's the one who catches that part of it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke catch the other part. So, a little bit of Bible trivia for you there. So Paul is saying, here is what it is. Here is Holy Communion. It is the gift of Jesus' body and blood. Now, the word starting in uh, verse, the second half of verse 23 is pretty much the exact same words I use every Sunday we celebrate communion. I'm basically quoting what Paul records in 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is basically gathering everything that's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and putting it all together. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the same thing. They record this is, the this is sentences. But some of the stuff around them, they're little very minor variations on the same theme. But Luke, or Mark, blah, Paul, <laughs> I'll get in my mouth to work. Paul takes all of that together and puts it together in what we've got here. And that's why we use it in our worship service. But the key element here is in verse 26. And not to give away my sermon, but <laughs> for those who've heard it already, there's our key element. We have received the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And that is what we proclaim. And that's all I'm going to say, because for those of you who haven't heard it yet, I want you to hear it in this full glory. <laughs> so, that's it. Now Paul adds, now, here's the, here's, he's, addressing the, he's addressing one part of the specific problem in Corinth. Now he's addressing the other part of the problem in Corinth as he sees it. And that's the worthiness of those who are going to receive Holy Communion. Because he's very clear. And this is the whole part of our celebration of communion that pretty much separates every single denomination in modern Christianity right now. Is what he's about to say. Because it's, we're still trying to figure out what he means. And how, and how to apply it. Can I have somebody read... 27, this is a bigger section, 27 to 32, please. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Keep going. 32. That is why many among who are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. So he's, he's, say, he's basically saying that um, there's an issue here to which the key issue is what we're still dealing with it. So we talked about the worthiness or not worthiness of someone coming to the table. This is why I take my responsibility as the means by which God uses to give out his forgiveness. I take this part extremely seriously. That I do not want anybody to receive 
the body and blood of Jesus Christ in a manner that will bring condemnation upon them versus what it was intended. So, in other words, if I have somebody who's never been around Holy Communion, it's actually easier to teach somebody who's never been around it what communion means than it is to have somebody who's coming from a different background. It's easier to teach, like Taylor. I'm not picking on you, my dear, but you, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being who you are. Taylor, Taylor's back, you know, I can tell you exactly what it is. And there's no baggage. Okay? In other words, there, there's nothing to, to, well, wait a minute. My former pastor said, or my former denomination said, there's none of that baggage. So it's a clear, wonderful, open heart and mind. And I thank you for that. <laughs> but when we have a problem, that's when we have the preconceived ideas and the preconceived baggage. That's when the challenge becomes. And that's why I ask people. That's why you, Natasha, you came to me. And I says, I, I have to ask two key questions. First question is, what's happening? What do you believe is happening when we celebrate Holy Communion? And the second key question is, is what is it doing for you? It addresses the two major issues of Holy Communion. What it is and what it does. And the answers have been varied from many different people that I've asked the same question, have been very, many different variations, but the answers I'm expecting to hear, it is, well, it's the body and blood of Jesus, and it forgives me of my sins. When I hear those two answers, you're good to go, come on, come on to the table. You and I already had that conversation. So you're good to go when you know that, when you believe that. If I hear a variation on those answers, a variation on a theme, or something completely like, where did you get that one from? I will be very nice and say, we need to talk first. Can I ask you not to come up to the table? If I couch it in that way, we don't get the hard feelings. They just don't happen. It, what happens is when I don't bring that up, and I don't say it, and that's my problem. If I don't say that, then and, I, and sometimes people will be expecting to get it, and I skip over, and I apologize for that. Then they go, why did he just skip me? Or why did he give me a blessing instead of the, the, the Lord's Supper? And then I got then I got to backtrack. <laughs> then I got then I got to um, rethink my my point of view. But the bottom line is. I do not, because God has called me to be the one who administers his sacrament, it is my responsibility to make sure when I give somebody the sacrament of Holy Communion that they know what's going on, what it is, and what it's doing. Because my whole point is I want them to receive what Jesus intended it to receive, and that's forgiveness of sins. That's why, that's why I also ask people to wait. And when I ask them to wait very nicely, they're good. Everything's good. So this is the problem. This is the problem they're dealing with. And the problem that we're dealing with wraps around one simple, loaded phrase. And now, Margie, the translation that you read, I, I, and, it's in, and I keep, my Bible keeps opening back to John. I don't know. Does God want me to be back in John? I don't know. Anyway, the key phrase is that you've read in verse 29. For those who eat and drink without discerning, now you said, the, your translation said the body of the Lord. I can understand that, that translation, but in most other translations, the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. In Lutheran circles, I'm going to back up by saying this, there is a... Uh, she has it too. Body of the Lord? Yeah, the Lord's body. The Lord's body. Okay. So body of Christ. Body of, yeah, the modern translations are, are using the word Christ or Christos, which is in the original language. And instead of translating it as the Lord, they're translating it as, they're not translating it. They're just, that's the name. She has Lord too. Lord Okay. Yeah, wonderful English language Bibles. You never know what they're going to put. But here's, but here's the point. In Lutheran circles, we have, we have a way of looking at words in, in the Bible, or phrases. This phrase, the body of the Lord, the body of Christ, 
we look at it in a very narrow definition, narrowly focused, meaning the body and the body and blood of Jesus Christ in and with the bread and wine. That's the most narrow definition. And then there's a broader definition, a wider definition that Paul uses also in 1 Corinthians, but he uses it in a different way. He refers to the body of Christ as us. He uses it in both ways. The narrow way, specifically referring to Holy Communion. The bigger way is the teachings of the body of Christ, of the people of God. And that's what the church has been wrestling with, trying to understand is that single phrase. Because depending upon your side of side of the coin on that on that uh, argument, will determine how you administer Holy Communion. For example, if we are looking at that in the broad sense, meaning uh, if I cannot discern what the body of Christ is and what the body of Christ teaches as a whole, then we're going to administer communion in one way. If we're looking at it in the narrow sense, which I believe Paul is addressing here in 1 Corinthians 11, then we're just dealing with the immediacy of Holy Communion celebration. So in other words, to use it, the vernacular of our synod, it's either close or closed. There are some pastors who will say, no, it's not close communion, it is closed But that's communion. the thing, it doesn't mention denominations in here at all. It doesn't. Nowhere in the book. It does not. I mean, you know, I mean, we were at churches, actually the last church was with my church service with my grandmother, who actually, they were going to a Lutheran church. But they so spelled out on the very front of the of the mm -hmm. uh, handout. Right. We practice closed communion. Oh, if you are not a member of this church, you're yeah. not welcome, basically. So she didn't go to communion, which would have been like the last time she would have gone oh, to man. communion. And it's like that is it's not biblical at all. No. The <laughs> synod's point of view, I think, is is accurate, and that is close, similar belief. What that means is, when I believe, I'm, I'm going based strictly about what Paul says here. When God, when God through Paul tells us that this is what Holy Communion is, and this is what Holy Communion does, if you believe that, you are in a close fellowship with us, and you can partake. The rest of the teachings are needed and necessary, like the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed. For example, if I was taking body and blood of Jesus Christ, my brain is going, and I know who he is. He, my, Jesus Christ is the uh, one and only Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, etc., as, we, as I run through the second article of the Apostles' Creed. Or I, I can express that. Uh, I can express that Jesus is the forgiveness of my sins. I can express the fact that the Holy Spirit. So if I can express those things, I'm good to go. And I, and I will treat everybody as such. There are some differences that we need to address and need to be clear. The whole concept of Holy Communion is symbolic. It is a symbolic act. And I heard one pastor say this. Um, my son and his family, they go to a, a church in Garland, and they, they invited us to a, a presentation. And I'll we'll wrap this up. They invited us to a presentation of the Last Supper, it was on Palm Sunday evening. And they invited us, it was a really good presentation, and the pastor got up, and I did not know that this was going to be what they call a sacrament meeting. Ended up becoming one. And the pastor got up, and he, he basically started to say the words of institution, but he interjected one key phrase. And remember, this is the body of, this is this bread, which represents, whoops, That close. <laughs> yeah. If somebody tells me when I ask the question, they think it's a representation of Christ's body or a representation of Christ's blood, I have to say we need to talk yeah. because that's not what we believe here. We believe in the literal words of Jesus Christ. This is for the forgiveness of sins. And I will wrap it up by saying this: the big difference between denominations today. 
is the focal point of two phrases. Either you're going to focus upon the remembrance of it, aka that's when it becomes symbolic, is because it's, I'm doing it because Jesus asked me to do it to remember him and what he did. That's why I'm doing it. That's one massive section of Christianity goes in that, in that category. Or the other category. This is. And then there's a couple of denominations that take that a little too far going the other direction, but we're still in the framework of this is my Christ's body for the forgiveness of sins. That's, that's, why, that's why communion is such the most highly charged conversation between denominations right now. And I figure next week, we've got a couple extra weeks, we'll dive more into this. This is going to be fun. I think. Let's, let's wrap up with prayer. Father, give you thanks and praise for all of the blessings you bestowed to us, especially the gift of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Father, for giving to us his body and his blood in Holy Communion. Thank you for giving him who died on the cross as he shed his body, gave up his body, shed his blood. Father, we ask you to be with us and strengthen us. Guide us and direct us in our wonderful faith that uh, just takes hold of this promise. Be with us now as we go either to worship or go to home. Father, guide us and direct us in the wonderful uh, life you've given us so that we proclaim you until the day he comes. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus, and all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody.